uh, continue this morning with a series uh, that is looking at tested faith. We are looking at uh, the books of James, Peter, and John. And by the way, you realize those letters were you know, written as individual letters and later at some time were collected together into the order that we now have in the New Testament. And my complaint is, I don't know who the guy was that came up with the order, how they were put together, but he should have been, did it Peter, James, and John. I mean, that's the way we're used to saying it anyway, right? But it's James, Peter, and John, those books that we generally call the general epistles. And we've been looking at texts from the general epistles that talk about how our faith is tested. But the uh, text we begin with, the text we're looking at today, begins with what we would call a prophecy. And there's all kinds of prophecy in Scripture. Some prophecies are very straightforward and, uh, and, and simple, like when Jeroboam began the false worship in the northern kingdom of building the golden calves and, and altars to them. A prophet who is not named is sent to him, and he proclaims, altar, altar, this is what the Lord says, a son named Josiah will be born to the house of David. On this he will sacrifice the priests of the high places who have made offerings here, and human bones will be burned on you. Well, as it turns out, hundreds of years later, King Josiah comes to the throne and in uh, review, uh, uh, renewing the worship of God and moving God, uh, Israel back to the worship as outlined in the book of the law that was found in the temple, he went as far as the northern kingdom and he uh, tore up the idols that Jeroboam had built there. He even dug up the bones of the priests and burned them on their altar. Very straightforward prophecy a very straightforward uh, uh, fulfillment. But sometimes prophecy gets a little bit harder, uh, a little bit more complex. Uh, like in Isaiah 14, uh, 7, 14, when uh, Isaiah goes to King Ahaz, who is all concerned because this alliance of kings are pressing on him, and he gives them this prophecy. The Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and, you will call, and will call him Emmanuel. And then he goes on and says, Before the boy knows enough to reject the wrong and choose the right, the land of the two kings you dread will be laid waste. Well, the prophecy to Ahaz is pretty simple. A young woman, the Hebrew word for virgin, can be translated either virgin or young woman. It's going to have a kid, and before that kid uh, is old enough to know the difference between right and wrong, five or six, ten or twelve, 30 or 40, however long it takes, before that happens, your enemies are going to be destroyed. But we know there's more to that prophecy than just Ahaz's political concerns. Because Matthew takes that and using the Greek word for virgin says the prophecy was that a virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will name him God with us. So sometimes prophecies are a little more than just straightforward predictions. But the one we're going to look at this morning from 1 Peter seems to be pretty straightforward. The end of all things is near. Um, well, that's pretty plain. Peter says the end of all things is near. The problem was that he said that almost 2,000 years ago. A lot of history has taken place, some of it good, some of it bad, uh, some, most of it uh, somewhere in the middle. And, a lot, and the, we're still here. We're still talking about this text that he wrote on the eve of the Neronian persecution, uh, somewhere around AD 60. The end of all things is near. Um, well, the Bible is very plain when it comes to the end time. It's just a little confusing. But as far as straightforward and plain, the Bible is very plain. Notice just a few verses here. Romans 13 and verse 12. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. Or Philippians 4 and verse 5. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Hebrews 10 verse 25. This is right after the text that says you've got to come to church no matter what. Don't forsake the assembly of yourselves together. Remember that text? He ends it encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. There is a day approaching. And then James 5 and verse 8. You too be patient and stand, stand firm because the Lord's coming is near. And that fits very well with the text we just read from 1 Peter 4, uh, 17, uh, 7. Rather, The end of all things is near. 
So the Bible is very plain. It just can be very confusing sometimes. Um, I, I like what Edward Fudge said years ago. The, the late Edward Fudge was a great guy. He's the only Church of Christ preacher that I know that has a movie made about his life. If you haven't watched the movie Hell and Mr. Fudge, you ought to give it a, a look. But anyway, he said this in referring to some of the same passages that I just read. Uh, these aren't calendar statements. They are theological statements made as New Testament writers look backward at Jesus and then reflect on the implications of what he has wrought. And look at what they see. The Messiah, the resurrection, salvation for the nations, and the Holy Spirit. He, each end time persons or events, all have come in Jesus. Yes, what the Bible says is clear uh, about the end time, even if we get confused about it. It does talk about the end coming, but what it talks about every time, the emphasis of the text is not when, but what. Uh, what we are to do in response to the fact that we believe the end is coming. The night is nearly, this is, these are the same texts I just read earlier. The night is nearly over, the day is almost here, so, so what? Let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in carousing and drunkenness. And it goes on to give a list of sins. Uh, Philippians 4, let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. The Lord is near what? Well, let your gentleness be evident to all, for one thing, and don't be worried, but pray, right? That in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. So, the end is coming, so devote yourselves to prayer. And that the text we read, encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching, so what? So, if we deliberately keep on sinning after we have received a knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sins is left. Finally, James 5, you too be patient and stand firm because the Lord's coming is near. The Lord's coming is near, so what? So, don't grumble against one another, brothers and sisters, or you will be judged, the judges at the door. You see, the, the uh, witness of Scripture is uh, very clear, and that is the Lord is coming, and therefore, because He is coming, we don't know when, but because He is coming, we need to watch the way that we live. We need to be careful of how we treat one another, and that's going to be the point of the text we're going to look at this morning from uh, 1 Peter 4. Uh, we've been talking about the testing of our faith, and here's the test for today. We need to live as people that have one eye of the heavens and one ear, listen, that's all I have, one ear listening for the trumpet call of God while we are as busy as we can be serving and loving and doing what's, what God calls us to do. The way we get ready for the coming of God, the way we get ready for the trumpet call is to serve. And that's what Peter is going to talk about this morning. So let's start with the text. First Peter 4 verse 7. The end of all things is near, as we've already read, therefore be alert and of sober mind so that you may pray. After all, above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. So the end of all things is near, therefore you see, anytime there's a therefore in the Bible, you need to find out what it's there for. Therefore, because the end of all things is near, be alert and of sober mind. Uh, depending on your translation, the word choice there, those are really two sort of synonyms. Uh, and, and different translations choose different ones. It's the same word that is used in Mark chapter 5 um, when the, um, Jesus heals the demoniac. And uh, the guy that was, you know, ripping his clothes off and breaking chains and living in this. So, and Jesus casts out the demons and the people came and saw him sitting there dressed in his right mind. The Lord's coming is near. So what? We need to be in our right mind. We need to focus. Or uh, it is the same word that is used when Paul tells Timothy, keep your head in all situations. Uh, you know, the coach may tell you, keep your head in the game. No, what I'm just telling you is remember what's important. Remember, focus. Do what you're supposed to be doing. So we, because the Lord's coming is near, we need to be 
focused and alert and serious minded and focused on what's really important because it's so easy for us to get dis uh, distracted by what's going on. We find ourselves focusing on things that really don't matter. And so then he says, so that you may pray. We, we ran into this earlier, that uh, one of the responses to the fact that we really believe that, uh, that God, the Lord is coming is we need to be serious-minded and sober so we can pray and focus. Uh, and, and remember the prayer the New Testament ends with, right? Even so, come quickly. Right? Maranatha, Lord, come. Um, we need to be praying and focusing on what... Somebody asked me one time, why do, why do why we always folded our hands and bowed our heads when we prayed? And it's basically tradition, and we were taught to do it that way, and we taught our kids to do it that way in the New Testament. There's all kinds. Sometimes people are falling down flat on their face in prayer. Sometimes people are lifting their arms in prayer. In fact, Paul commands men to do that everywhere. Um, but it, so the body posture really doesn't matter. But there may be something to it. But when we fold our hands and bow our heads, perhaps we are becoming as sober and clear-minded as we possibly can. We're, we're cutting out the distractions around us so that we can focus on prayer. And that's exactly what Peter tells us to do here. And then he says, above all, love each other deeply. Peter keeps coming back there. Remember the text we looked at last week for 1 Peter 3. One of his uh, points about how to show faith, uh, the test of faith when, when uh, things are going wrong and people are abusing you and that kind of thing, is you need to rely on each other because you need each other. And you're, above all, love each other deeply. You know, it's almost like Peter thinks that it's the greatest commandment to love one another. Um, in... Hey, it is the greatest commandment, right? The greatest commandment is to love God, all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. The second greatest commandment, Jesus said, is love your neighbor as yourself. And Peter says, above all, love each other. Again, Peter is writing just on the cusp, just before the great persecutions that are going to break out in Rome. They've already gone through some difficult situations, and they're going to go through even more. And when you're doing that, you need people on your side. You need people you can rely on. And you know what? We need that today as well. Uh, there are going to be crises that are going to happen in all of our lives. And we need people on which to rely. I remember thinking years and years and years ago when we had a, a death of a person in our church that uh, was not uh, of the age in which you would think death would be a, 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 a possibility, you know, a younger person. And uh, people rallied around the family both while the person was declining and then afterwards. And we had a wonderful memorial service and, and then we're eating together. And I remember thinking, how does someone go through the loss of a family member like this and don't have a church family to fall back on? Um, we need to be so close that we cannot imagine getting through the crises in life in our lives without family to fall back on. But he doesn't say just love each other as in a general thing. He says offer hospitality to each other. Um, hospitality. What do you think of when you think of hospitality? Um, we think generally of getting together with friends and eating together. But hospitality, if you look in the Bible, is entertaining strangers. People that are in need, you invite them into your home. We live in a, a very different world, but this business of hospitality is still important. Remember, Peter was writing to a church where it was going through difficulty and hardship, and uh, some of them were losing businesses. Some of them were uh, being discriminated against and losing their, where they lived, and there were your people without a way to make a living. And so what is the church going to do? Offer hospitality. Be the fallback for one another. And, and so hospitality still is incredibly important uh, uh, today as we not just love each other because that can be kind of a generic thing, uh, but we need to be there to help one another when that's necessary. 
And then he continues in verse 10, each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its many forms. Okay, now again, this is all in the therefore uh, after the end of all things is near, right? And so we should use whatever gifts we have received and, um, as faithful stewards of God's grace. Same word, gift and grace. God has gifted us and graced us in so many different ways. You know the old song we used to sing, Count Your Many Blessings? Suppose we just took turns standing and God gave us the memory and the boldness to do so. We just took turns standing and reciting all of the many blessings that God has given to us. How long would our service last? The question is, would we be done in time to start next week? Because we, God has blessed us and graced us in so many, many ways. But what he says here is, none of those are yours. Whether you're talking about talents, whether you're talking about time, whether you're talking about money, whether you're talking about any gift that God has given you, you are a steward of that gift. In other words, it's not yours. God has given it to you, and you're to be faithful in how you use it. Uh, you use your gift to serve others because you're a faithful steward of God's grace in its many forms. What is the gift that God has given you? And are we faithfully using those gifts to serve others? And so then he gives us some examples in, um, in verse uh, 11. Um, if anyone speaks... They should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do it with the strength that God provides. Okay, is your gift speaking? Um, well, if you're, going to, if you're going to have that gift, you need to use it to bless others, to serve others. That's the whole point of what he's saying is. And what's going to serve others is, of course, speaking the very words of God. I, I read a story this past week in the news that there was a, a preacher who was preaching, it was a streaming service, I don't know if there was a crowd at all present, but he was in the middle of a streaming service preaching his sermon when a thief showed up and robbed the preacher of $450,000 in jewelry. The preacher was wearing $450,000 of jewelry. Well, I, you know, I always keep mine in the safety deposit box. I never wear it while I'm preaching. I never can tell, you know, like, um, you see, that could make the argument that preacher may have been served by the church rather than serving by declaring the words of God. So um, if, if you have been gifted with the ability to speak, then do so with the very words of God. If your uh, gift is to serve, then do it with the strength that God provides. You know, that's something that we're reminded that the ability to do things is a gift of God. And he also provides the strength to use it to serve others. What that means is, is that if we've been gifted in something and God gives us the strength to use that to bless others, it's God that's doing the work. He's using us as his instrument to do the work that he wants to do. So when Renee and Richard are at the jails doing the jail ministry, they're using their gift to serve other people. That's God working through them, giving them the strength that he provides. When Hayward's back in the kitchen, uh, the bathroom rather, renovating and building and people are helping him, they, God has given gifts and he's using those gifts to serve others. That's God at work. When various of you are doing things to help others uh, to, uh, in, in, in ways where they're st struggling and, and you've got some time or you've got some, uh, some insight or you've got some experience, God has given that to you and God is working through you. God is at work. That's the way that we get ready for the return of God, for allowing God to work in us in the various ways that God gifts us. Um, the, the strength that God provides so that, as he continues the verse, in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. That, okay, when we are, the end of all things is near, therefore, 
we serve, we use our gifts to serve other people, and in that way, Christ is glorified, and people are attracted to him so they can get ready for the time when Christ returns. That's what we're called to do. So, we kind of made a right turn as far as what most people think when they think about a lesson that begins, the end of all things is near. Okay, an end of the world thing. The end is near. It is. So, love each other deeply. The emphasis on the greatest command, to love one another. That as a Christian family, we are to focus on relationships and we are to be there for each other, not just in word, but in deed, helping each other to meet needs and to get through the day when we need help and assistance and encouragement. And we are to use the gifts that God has given us to serve other people. And when we do that, we are faithful stewards of the, of the gift and the grace of God. So what does that have to do with the end of the world? You see, there's some that think focusing on the end of the world is coming up with an exact date to know when it is. And you've, we've all read all of those um, folks that are so sure. You know, back in the 1800s, there was a group whose followers were so sure it was going to be on this date, uh, you know, at noon. And they go up on hills and they put on their ascension robes and they stand there ready for God to come. They may still be there. I don't know, but he didn't come. That's, predicting the time is not how we get ready for the end. Serving one another, loving one another, allowing God to work through us. That's how we get ready for the end time. The end of all things is near. Again, a theological statement that Christians at every age if God comes back tomorrow, it's true. If God comes back in a million years, it's true. But we have to live in a certain way because the end of all things is near. I don't know if y'all are cultured enough for this illustration, but country comedian Jerry Clower told a story of a friend of his, Kurt, that lived down the dirt road off the main road going into Yazoo City, Mississippi. Well, Kurt was a very religious fella, and one day he goes out and he looks up and he sees judgment written in the sky. Except it wasn't judgment written in the sky, it was Pepsi-Cola. A skywriter had written, had written Pepsi-Cola out and the wind, you know, stayed there a while. The plane was long gone and the wind was doing things with it. But Kurt was convinced, judgment written in the sky. And so he screamed and he started running, to, well, he jumped off the porch and tripped over the faucet that he had jammed in the ground to make people think he had running water. But he got up and he just ran down the road screaming at the top of the lungs, judgment is coming. Until somebody finally tackled him and got him calmed down a little bit. They're both sitting there on the side of the road all covered in you know, red clay from the dirt road and panting. And finally the friend that tackled him said, well, Kurt, what, are you going to, what were you going to do if it was judgment? And he said, well, I was just going to keep on running until judgment overtook me. Well, that's not a good response to the end of all things is near. You're not going to outrun judgment. And it's not a good response. On the other hand, and this is what most of us do, is we pretend like it's uh, going to happen someday but it doesn't really affect me today. That God's going to come back or I'm going to die. I mean, we can all say that, right? But we don't make those choices. Like we saw uh, 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 Wednesday night in our Francis Chan video, we spend all of our time on the one end of the rope taking care of things and pretending like the, uh, the end that goes out into eternity doesn't happen that... Um, we live our lives making decisions and living in a certain way, like we've got all the time in the world. And the end of all things is near. I know that's true because God said it. And the reason he said it is to make sure that I'm making choices and that you're making choices that um, make it so that we're ready when the end comes. 
Because one day we're going to hear that trumpet of the Lord call and time will be no more. One day every knee will bow at the name of Jesus and every tongue confess that he is Lord. But our call is to bow at the knee of Jesus today and serve him today. As we sing this next song.